all stand together.
you, Lord God, for that blessed night when you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to be our Savior, to be the salvation for the world. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I've asked Scott and Becky Allen if they would come and share with us in the scripture reading. You'll find it on the screen. It's also in your notes, and uh, it would uh, also be in your Bible, of course, uh, Revelation chapter 21. If you don't have a Bible, then uh, the ushers have ones that you can use and share. We want to welcome all the guests and the new visitors and hope you feel especially welcome today. If you'll join me, we are going to read Revelation chapter 21 from verse 9 through chapter 22, verse 22. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with twelve gates, and with twelve angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the twelve tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. The wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates, and its walls. The city was laid out like a square, as long as it was wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length, and as wide and high as it is long. He measured its walls and it is 144 cubits thick by man's measurement, which the angel was using. The wall was made of jasper in the city of pure gold, as pure as glass. The foundations of the city were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third caldone, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolith, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh jasneth, and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each gate was made of a single pearl. The great street of the city was of pure gold like transparent glass. I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives its light, and the lamp and the lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and the honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the lamb's book of life. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the trees are for the healing of the nations. Let us bow for prayer. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to gather in freedom and safety in a warm church to worship you. Help us enjoy the beauty of nature as we adapt to a changing Minnesota season. We raise up those in our family and those we know who are facing challenges, changes, and losses. You provided Jesus as our example, who faced every temptation and physical suffering, and yet overcame and was victorious. In today's reading, thank you very much for giving us this revelation of who you are and what is to come and how vast is your love for us. Thank you for preserving this word picture for century upon century so that we can savor it today. Father, this glimpse into the splendor and details of your city fills us with awe and reverence. Thank you for building a home in this awesome city for each of us who have our name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. 
What a glorious city in which we are privileged to live and worship you throughout eternity. Bless Pastor Phil. Guide and strengthen him as he brings today's message. Help us to be receptive so that we will be encouraged and transformed by what you want us to receive. We worship you. We honor you. We love you for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Scott and Becky. Did I say Nelson? I meant Alan. Scott and Becky, Alan, appreciate so much uh, your being with us. Hey, I want to uh, involve you as we get started. I want you to turn to one or two neighbors, uh, maybe somebody other than your own family. Turn to one or two neighbors and tell them the most beautiful thing you ever have seen in your life. Now, you can't say that it was your wife or your husband. It has to be a building or a place of scenery or something. What's the most beautiful thing you've ever seen in your life? Okay, turn around, talk to two people. Go. All right, let's find out. Mary Palmquist, what's the most beautiful thing you've ever seen in your life? Sunrise. Sunrise and a moonrise. Jeff. I just heard of it, the, the, the majesty of, of the mountains. I was raised out west, and it's just, uh, just in the pine trees and looking up in the bay, it's, just, it's, it's a serenity. Though. Cool. Galen. Wow, wow. Gary. Double rainbow over Lake George. Marla. Well, outside my new grandson. Whoa! <laughs> Great. How many of you have seen Grand Canyon? I don't know whether I'd call it beautiful, but awesome. I just stood there and I was just blown away by the massive size of that canyon. Well, today I want to talk to you about the New Jerusalem, and I want to tell you something. It is more beautiful than anything you have ever seen in your life, even, even more beautiful than Jack Jorgensen, if you can believe that. And I want to start out by saying that heaven is real. It is not make-believe. It is not foggy. It is not just clouds. It is not just spirit. There are bodies in heaven. I believe there are mountains in heaven. I believe there are buildings in heaven. In heaven. One of the things, one of the dangers in treating the book of Revelation is that there are some things that are really difficult to understand, like the beast that comes out of the water and all kinds of different symbols. But we've got to be careful that we don't look at the book of Revelation as just a bunch of symbols that are just kind of gobbledygook and you can make them, to make them say whatever you want them to say. We have to take the text of Scripture as literally as we possibly can. Now when it speaks of Jesus as a lamb, it's using an allegory. Jesus doesn't have four legs, my goodness. And you know, why, you know why he's called a lamb, because he gave his life as a sacrifice for you and for me. But as we look at the New Jerusalem, and it describes all of the beautiful jewels that it is made of, and the transparency of the gold, and all of the majestic things that are there, don't just put them in the category of allegory or of storytelling or of myth. There's very much that is real as the seat that you're sitting on today or the person right next to you. The New Jerusalem is coming down. The Bible says that the angel took John. I don't know whether it took him bodily or in spirit or what, 
but it, it took him to a mountaintop where he could see that the new Jerusalem was coming down out of heaven. Now, what's the new Jerusalem? Well, the Bible does say that in the end times, uh, after all this other stuff in Revelation has taken place, that there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And some people say that the new Jerusalem is the new heaven, that new Jerusalem is heaven. Some say that the new Jerusalem is a city that is between the new earth and the new heaven. I don't know which one it is. I do know that the new Jerusalem gives us a good description of what the afterlife is going to be, and that's what we're going to talk about today. In uh, Eugene Peterson's book on the book of Revelation, he, he divides this chapter and the two verses of chapter 22 into three sections where he talks about the striking features of heaven, which are number one, symmetry, number two, full of light, and number three, fruitfulness. Now, I'm not taking everything I say from Eugene Peterson, but I found his basic outline helpful in putting this sermon together. So let's talk a little bit about symmetry. It says that the new Jerusalem descends from heaven. Now, it descends from heaven because it already exists. The new Jerusalem is out there somewhere. We can't see it with the naked eye. You can go as far into space as you want to go. And you and I don't have the capacity or the kinds of eyes that are needed to see it. I'm not saying that our resurrection eyes are just spiritual eyes that only see spirits. They see bodies, but they see things that we can't see now. And it comes down out of heaven. It already exists. And we know that because Jesus, before he ascended, said to his disciples, I go to what? Prepare a place for you, that when I come again, I can take you with me, and you will be with me always. The city, secondly, it's, it's symmetrical. It has symmetry. It has 12 of just about everything. If you look in the text, you'll see the, the number 12 over and over again. It has 12 gates, 12 angels, 12 names of tribes, 12 foundations, 12 apostles, 12 different precious stones, and multiples of 12, 12,000 stadia. Well, stadia translated into our language uh, is miles. 12,000 stadia is 1,500 miles. We'll talk about that a little bit more. And it says that the walls of the city are 144 cubits in measurement. That's how thick the wall is. That also is a multiple of 12. Why all the 12s? Well, some like to say that the Jews borrowed their fascination with 12 from the signs of the zodiac. Uh, there's nothing really substantial uh, to make that true, believable. I think, and most commentators believe, that the 12 goes back to the fact that God created 12 tribes. He made 12 tribes of the people of Israel. And all the way through the Bible, you find the 12 over and over and over again. And so 12 is a very important number. In fact, one commentary writes that the 12 is a symbol of unity and completeness determined by God's design and election. In other words, why? why 12 is so important? It's important because God said there would be 12 tribes. God said there would be 12 apostles. God said that there would be 12 stones on the breastplate of the high priest as he went in and prayed for the people of Israel. Another thing that we discover about the symmetry of the city of New Jerusalem is that it is huge. It is ginormous. It is a it is 1,500 feet. It's not only a square, which the Greeks thought was perfection, but it's cube. And it's 12, excuse me, 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles in length, and 1,500 miles in depth. It's an absolutely ginormous city. And you're thinking to yourself, now how can, I can understand the, the length and the width, but what's the use of having a, a city that's 1,500 miles high? 
Is it, is it the biggest apartment building we've ever seen in our life? I honestly believe that John is trying to describe something that he can't, he, he can't really get his arms around. And, and that's what he sees, that's what he hears God saying, but I think to understand it, you have to add another dimension. I think you have to realize that we will be capable of living in tears or, I don't, I can't explain it. I, I think the picture is just meant for us to understand that this city is going to be, it's going to be huge. Another thing that's interesting about this city is that it's reminiscent of the Holy of Holies in the Old Testament and in the Old Temple and even in Herod's temple in the New temple, the Testament. Solomon's temple was 30 feet wide, 30 feet long, and 30 feet high. And the Jews had kind of a localized concept of God. The reason that they went to the temple and the reason that the priest went in the Holy of Holies, the high priest, once a year is because they felt like that it was in that Holy of Holies that God actually dwelt because there was the, the, the covenant and there was the law inside of that covenant box and the mercy seat on top of it representing God's forgiveness. But it was only a cube that was 30 feet wide by 30 feet long by 30 feet high, and they, they sort of felt like that's where God was in a physical sense. But John takes that picture and blows it up, just huge, bigger than any building you've ever designed, Kevin, I'm sure. 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles wide, and 1,500 miles high. And what's interesting about it is in the Old Testament, God supposedly dwelt in that little cubicle, but here it says he dwells in the whole new city. Another thing that's interesting about this city, why would God, why would God picture the New Jerusalem or heaven as a city? How many of you would rather live in the country than the city? I sure would. Why does he say city? Because in this world, cities seem to be the, the place, the highest concentration of evil and slums and crime and gangs and corruption, but not in the New Jerusalem. God's in the business of transforming things. God takes addicts and turns them into saints. God takes corrupt cities and turns them into places that are filled with wholeness and holiness and harmony and true happiness. The New Jerusalem is a polar opposite of the, the city of Babylon, which was full of corruption. And look what John says. In chapter 17, you don't have to look back there, but the angel says of Babylon, come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute. That's what he calls Babylon. But here in chapter 21, verse 9, the angel says of the new Jerusalem, he says, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. Another interesting thing about the, the city is that it has 12 gates. Twelve gates with three of them opening to the east, three to the north, three to the south, three to the west. And that's reminiscent of the Old Testament when the Jews were going through the wilderness and they would, they would camp three tribes to the north, three to the south, three to the east, and three to the west. And it's a beautiful picture of the fact that people from all around the world will gather together in the temple and in the New Jerusalem. I'm, I'm glad. I'm just trying to look around today. I, I'm glad that there are going to be black people in heaven. I'm glad that the Asians are going to be there. I'm glad that the Hispanics are going to be there. I'm glad that the people from India, I'm glad that the American Indians are going to be there. I'm glad that there will be people from every tribe, tongue, and nation in the New Jerusalem. Aren't you? 
We've, uh, for the most part in our ministry, lived in country towns. And about the only town that we've lived in, two of them, where, where there was a, a little bit of diversity in terms of nationality and, and race was Danville, Illinois, pretty large black population, and in Boone, North Carolina, pretty, pretty fair mix of people. But I'm, I'm just, I'm really looking forward to today when I can rub shoulders with people of every, every tongue and tribe and nation, all of them redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Is there an amen there? Amen. amen. And racial tensions will no longer exist, which means that we should probably try to live that like that now. And you and I will get along with people from every country and every tribe and every tongue and we'll understand each other. And another thing about the symmetry of this city is that it says it has walls. Now you say, why? Why would a city in heaven need to have walls? Walls are to keep out enemies. There aren't going to be any enemies. Well, who is John writing to? He's writing to the seven churches of Asia. He's writing to churches that are facing persecution. He's writing to churches that are under the thumb of the Roman government. He's trying to encourage them, and he's telling them, listen, when you get to heaven, when you get to the New Jerusalem, not only, not only is the city going to have walls and gates, but the gates are going to be open all the time because you will be eternally secure from any oppression. The devil will be gone. Sin will be gone. And you will live in harmony with others and with God for the rest of your life. Well, the city is also fullness of light. The city of New Jerusalem will dwarf any light show that you and I have ever seen. The materials in it are just unbelievable beyond description. All kinds of precious stones, most of which we have a hard time pronouncing, at least I do. And it's not because of the cost of these precious stones. These are not, uh, uh, what's that dumb commercial, something begins with K? Every kiss begins with K. Have you heard that? Uh, I mean, the jewels in heaven are going to just knock Mary Kay out of business, or Kay, or whoever it is. I mean, it's just not, they don't compare, you know? Pearls that are as big as gates, get, give me a break. But the, the, the value of the stone is not, is not based on its cost. The value of the stone is based on its transparency and its ability to show color. I want you to look at the text, will you? How many of you have looked through a kaleidoscope? Just about all of you? Just a fusion of color? Well, look at, look at the text because it says that there's a lot of things that are going to be transparent. Look at verse 11. Jasper clear as crystal, gold in verse 18, pure as glass, verse 21, gold like transparent glass, and chapter 22, verse 1, the river of water of life as clear as crystal. Now you say transparent. Why? Why transparent? Well, transparent because you know what happens with with light when it goes through something that is transparent but also is able to reflect and separate light like the double rainbow that you were talking about up at Lake George. The, the beauty of light when it goes through a cloud or through a precious stone and the capacity for that light to just explode into all different kinds of colors. And the reason that there's so much of heaven, of the New Jerusalem, that's transparent is because the glory, the radiance of God is going to be able to spread throughout that entire city through walls, through stones, through you and through me to make it the most glorious thing. You will not just see a rainbow, you will be living in a rainbow. Just a gorgeous city. Transparent. No more sin. No more death. No more Satan. Just the presence 
of God. One of the things that came to my mind this week as I was trans just kind of thinking through this and praying about it was the fact that heaven will be blazing with the colorful light of God and hell is described in the Bible as the blackest darkness. Where would you rather be? Where would you rather be? And the last thing is fertility. Notice in chapter 22, verses 1 and 2, there's two images. One is the river of the water of life, and the other is the tree of life bearing 12 crops of fruit. It says that the nations will come together, nations from all over the world that I think still exist today will exist there, not in the same form because all that will be there are people who have come to know Jesus Christ as Savior, who have placed their trust in the blood of the Lamb, who gave his life as a sacrifice for us and for our sins. But what a great day. What a great place that's going to be. And it says that the trees in that land, by the way, in the Old Testament, in the book of uh, Genesis, when Adam and Eve sinned against God, what are the two trees that are mentioned? The tree of knowing good and evil and the tree of life, which they never tasted. Because after they tasted of the tree of knowing good and evil and sinned against God, they were banished from the garden. And the tree of life does not show up again in the Bible until it's just in passing mentioned in the book of Psalms. It comes up again here at the end of the Bible as the tree of life from which we partake that enables us to live forever and it will bear continuous fruit because the curse has been lifted, the curse of sin. There will be no blight, no hail, and the farmer said amen, and no rotting. Now what does this all mean to you and me today? This is the fun part. What does it mean? What does it mean for the here and now? Well, Listen to me carefully because I think something that the Apostle Paul says helps this all come into perspective. To, to make, to make what, what John says about heaven make any sense to you and me on earth, you've got to get the right perspective of earth and of heaven. The Apostle Paul writes these words. I think you've got it in the notes, guys. There's a PowerPoint. Paul says our citizenship is in heaven. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. What did he mean by that? Does, does he mean that we're supposed to have both of our feet firmly planted in heaven and that we're supposed to give up on earth? That's not what he means at all. You have to understand Paul's context when he wrote that. Paul was a Roman citizen, but he didn't live in Rome. He lived in other places and he traveled like crazy. He was able to appeal to his Roman citizenship to be able to get moved from one court to another in the process that fi finally brought him to death. But, but Paul was a Roman citizen. And, and what that meant is that back in that context, the Roman Empire was made up of a bunch of nations and city-states city states, Everybody spoke Greek. And Rome de-emphasized their own personal nationality or their country or their culture and wanted everybody to be first and foremost a Roman. They wanted their allegiance to be to Rome. And they were, they were looked at as being representatives of Rome no matter where they lived. And what Paul is saying is that you and I, even though we are citizens in heaven, are to be representatives wherever we live. You're a representative that lives in Little Falls or Royalton or wherever. You represent heaven. You bring heaven down. We're representatives of heaven wherever we live. In his prison cell, detained for helping Jews escape from Switzerland during the Holocaust, Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote these words. Listen real closely. He's writing these in a, in a six by nine cell in prison. 
the Christian hope of the resurrection sends a person back to his life on earth in a wholly new way. The Christian has no last line of escape available from earthly tasks and difficulties. This world must not be prematurely written off. As citizens of heaven, you and I make the striking features of heaven visible to the world in which we now live. We bring heaven down to earth. We do it by demonstrating symmetry in our lives. Listen to what Paul wrote. You have it on the screen. You are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the stones or of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Notice the words in the middle of those verses. In him, that's in Jesus, the whole building, that's us, the church, is joined together. I want to teach you a Greek word. The Greek word joined together is a really hard word, okay? So listen very closely. Lego. Lego. You and I are living stones, knitted together, fitted together in such a way that we build a house not of stone and bricks and mortar. We build a house, a congregation, built on Jesus Christ and the apostles and the prophets. And God comes to dwell in that house, not in the four walls of the church necessarily. God comes to dwell in us spiritually by his Holy Spirit. And as a group together, in the Holy Spirit, so that we are fitted together and we become the living habitation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you and I show heaven where we live. That's awesome. That's just a, that's just a great picture. And John uses that picture as he, as he puts together this, this picture of the New Jerusalem. He's not only talking about a future city, but he's talking about you and me living together in unity and harmony and symmetry in, in the congregation that we're a part of. I didn't plan this in my sermon, okay? And sometimes when I go ad lib, I get in trouble, but I just feel like the Lord's telling me to say this. I don't care what you feel about the building program. I really don't. I don't care if you're against it or for it, but it is not going to become an issue over, we, over us so that we divide and split and run off into different directions like the world does sometimes when they disagree about particular issues. We are going to stay together whether we build or don't build. Amen? Amen. The devil would like nothing more than to split us over stuff. And, and when churches, it's just historic that when churches go through building programs that, that folks just get their nose bent out of shape over everything. Express your opinion, but after you've expressed your opinion, don't, don't murmur. Don't murmur. The, the next thing, listen, listen to what he says in, in this next thing. You and I are to be lights in the world. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 14 through 15. Read this with me, will you? Let's read it out loud. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. Why are the stones in the building transparent in the New Jerusalem so that the light can penetrate them and it can be seen in all of its colors throughout the entire New Jerusalem. Why, why are you and I all different kinds of color of stone? 
so that the light can penetrate us and get through us to light up the room with a rainbow of colors, not all of them the same necessarily, but all of them from the same source. I, I've, I've grown up, I've been in the Alliance for about 40, oh, I've been in, since I was born. And, and some of the old saints used to talk about, oh, they describe humility as saying, oh, I want to hide behind the cross. And, and I understand what they were saying. They want to make the cross central, and they want to make the cross the, the point that people are drawn to, and they don't want to be drawn, people to be drawn to their own personal personality. I, I understand that. I get that. But God doesn't, God doesn't create us so that we can hide. God creates us so that we can be transparent jewels through which he demonstrates his light. And I would like to think of us more like being a stained glass window or a precious diamond with a huge light behind it that's just laser on that diamond that just flashes different kinds of colors all throughout the system. I want to be that way. And, and God's going to take Andrew's personality and God's going to take... Ines' personality and Steve's personality and, and all of you in this room, and he's going to shine through it in different ways so that we, we display different colors. And sometimes colors don't go together real well. But you got to get the idea that it's, it's just, it's God's light going through those colors. And because they're not the same color as your color, you might like red and they like blue. Well, so what? It's all beautiful together. And, and, and I like to think of my personality, which is goofy and warped and sometimes stupid and sometimes smart, but most of the time kind of goofy. And, and I like to just think that God shines through that in a way that blesses people. And he does that with yours, too. Anybody else admit to being a little bit goofy? Four or five of you, the rest of you are liars. <laughs> yeah, back there, goofy. That is, um, look back at the sound booth, okay? Stand up, you guys. Because <laughs> that's just... That's kind of who I am. If I told you some of the things I've done in 40 years of pastoral experience, you would just die. You would die. Can you see me in a tutu? <laughs> yeah, Mary Ellen's saying, stop, stop, stop. <laughs> Transparent. Say that word with me. Transparent. Some of us are so hard and so closed and so wrapped up in ourselves and so opaque that the light doesn't get through. Some of us wear such tight halos and live by such strict rules and are so isolated and think ourselves to death and are so perfectionistic that the light just has a hard time getting through. And all, all the world sees is just just us. But to bring the new Jerusalem, to bring heaven down, means that we become transparent. We become lights, not in and of ourselves, but we become precious jewels that radiate the light in ways that make something so beautiful that people are drawn to the Jesus that's behind it. And lastly, we become 
fruitful. Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. Paul writes it this way in the book of Colossians. He says, live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. Colossians 1.10. And in another place in Galatians, Paul writes, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You and I bear fruit in a couple of ways. Number number one, we bear fruit by living out the fruit of God's Spirit in our life, like patience. That's one I I have a hard time with that one. And joy and love and forbearance and kindness and goodness and faithfulness. That's one of the ways in which we bear fruit. Another way in which we bear fruit is when, we, when we're conscious of the fact that people around us need Jesus and we do what we can to, to reach out to them and to bring them to Jesus, to, to bring them to Jesus. I hope we pack this place out on Christmas Eve. I hope we have to bring in extra chairs like we did last year. I hope we have to sound it out into the lobby. You've got friends. I know you do. You've got friends who need Jesus, and they can find him here. It's not the only place that can find him, but they can find him here. Bring them. Bring them. Heaven is not escape, an escape from our earthly experience in Christ, but heaven is is a resurrected completion of our experience in Christ here. In the meantime, we bring heaven down. If we mean what we say, we say it every time we quote the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done in as it is in heaven. Bring heaven down. Let his light shine through you. Stand with me. Let's pray. I don't want to take away from your time out there, but let's just, let's just take a couple minutes together. Every head bowed and every eye closed. How many of you would say, would say of your, look at yourself as a precious jewel, as a, as a vehicle for light to flow through. You don't have to raise your hand or anything, but how many of you would you say that in your life you've got quite a few of the shades pulled so that the light can't get through? You're not, you're not really thinking in terms of your life being a vehicle of light. You're so wrapped up in yourself that you've become opaque rather than transparent. And, and you just want to, where you're at today, say, Lord Jesus, just in your own heart, say it, Lord Jesus, I'm, I've been hindering your light because the shades are pulled or because there's some junk in my life that I need to get get out of because it's blocking the light. And, and Lord Jesus, I want you to just flow. I want your light to just flow through me. Just, just pray that. It's just between you and God. Lord, help me to be a vehicle of light. Help me in my own way, in the way you've created me, in the gifts that you've given me, in the abilities that you've given me. Help me to be a person that sheds light on the dark world and draws people, entices people, woos people uh, to, to you. Not to me, but to you. Because of the way of, that your light is refracted when it comes through my personality and my house. God, I pray this with all my heart. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Amen? Amen? God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. Uh, Sunday school in 20 minutes. We may start five minutes late, but I think 20 minutes is enough. Stick around. Find somebody to talk to. Get a cup of coffee. Put a lid on it. And uh, there's some cookies out there, too. <laughs>